Our next speaker is Scott Sharon from Alstom. He's Vice President of Marketing and Strategy in North America. And he has almost 15 years experience in the rail transportation industry, working both freight and transit customers in North America, China, and Europe. He has been with Alstom for the past four years, serving as Vice President North America with responsibility for business development, marketing, strategy, and government industry relations. Previously, he worked for GE Transportation in both the United States and in China, where he focused on growing their business through new product introductions and corporate mergers and acquisitions. He also established their signaling business in Beijing. China was where he, in Beijing, China, where he was responsible for sales and marketing, product management, and product engineering teams. And I also want to say that Alstom has also been a great supporter of the U.S. High Speed Rail Association, and we appreciate the ongoing support, and we do want to encourage other people to join the association so we can help continue to grow this uh, message and keep getting it out there. We're, we're definitely making a lot of progress in the country, but there's still a lot more work to do in changing the message and getting the, the reasons out there that we need to do it. So uh, once again, thank you. And, and please welcome Scott Sharon. Uh, thanks, Andy, for the introduction. Uh, thank all of you for uh, taking the time to be here with us this morning. I love high-speed rail. Um, as Andy mentioned, I've been both on the freight side of the world and the passenger side of the world. And the reason I like high-speed high rail is it's unique in passenger rail in that it makes money. Uh, a lot of other passenger rail is a public good, it's a public service, it's valued, it's needed, high-speed is as well. Uh, but the unique aspect about high-speed rail is the operators can be profitable, they can make money, and a lot of the same arguments that we hear brought up from the detractors uh, really don't apply to high-speed rail. We need to be able to cut through that as an industry and help people understand that it actually is a very good investment, not just as a public service, but also for return on investment. So I thought today, uh, to mix it up a little bit, we'd focus a little bit on energy efficiency in high-speed trains. Uh, there's another uh, very big conference going on right now, the uh, UN Conference on Climate Change. I arrived uh, last night from New York. When I left New York, it was about 60 degrees. When I arrived in Los Angeles, it was about 60 degrees. That's strange in December. Um, and when I got into my hotel room, Governor Brown was on. And he was throwing out some numbers. The only one that really stuck in my mind that uh, really hit me was that in California, the state consumes 32 billion gallons of gasoline, I think was the number he put out. He then started talking about number of trips, number of cars, he speaks very fast. Uh, but the message was clear that there's way too much fossil fuel being used in the state of California today. And when you look at energy efficiency and ways to address it, rail is one of the best and high speed rail plays a unique role in that. Hitting the wrong button. So if you look at rail, Today, globally, rail has 8 to 10 percent of um, market share for moving passengers. If you look at the passenger space, it's about 8. If you look at freight, it's about 10. But if you look at the CO2 emissions from rail, uh, rail accounts for less than 2 percent. So uh, unlike other modes of transportation, the amount of CO2 emissions that come from rail is far lesser than um, uh, per passenger, per mile, ho however you want to manage it. And if you look across all modes, whether it's high speed, whether it's metro, wh whether it's uh, light rail or streetcars, you see the same, uh, same similar types of numbers in every type of mode. And the nice part about it is they're all complementary. When you have high speed, it connects into cities where you connect into metros, you connect into light rail systems, and you end up creating this virtuous cycle of energy efficiency, carbon reduction, better energy efficiency, and better uh, impact on the climate overall. So let's look at high speed and why is energy important? Uh, you know, it gets back to that economic uh, return on investment story, and it gets back to cost. You know, if you look at high speed, uh, well, if we look at rail in general, only about 4% of the operating cost in rail is energy, right? So you'll typically look at labor, you'll typically look at energy costs, you'll typically look at maintenance costs. And, and if you look at cars versus uh, bus versus plane versus railway, you can see what a small piece that the energy consumption actually plays in rail. 
And when you look at high speed in general compared to the other modes uh, of rail, high speed is in fact actually much more efficient than the other modes of rail. Now, the, the chart on the bottom uh, doesn't really reflect today's situation. We see uh, energy prices that are much lower, in fact, closer to what the values were in 2005. But again, if you're running a business, if you're running a high-speed operation, you can't deal with volatility in your operating costs and not knowing what they're going to be from one year to the next. You can't budget, you can't plan, you can't run a profitable operation. So if you can take that volatility of energy cost out of what you do and reduce it to a very small fraction, it makes a big difference. Look at yourselves in this room and look at how your budget, personal budgets have changed based on how much additional discretionary money you have because you don't have to spend as much on gasoline. That's great today. We don't know what that's going to be in five years, 10 years, 15 years. And as a business operator, removing that variability from your operation is very helpful, is a very good thing. And as a state, when it looks at budgeting, being able to know that the energy cost to move people has reduced dramatically because you're now moving them by high-speed rail or other modes of transportation is a societal benefit and a good thing for all of us. So the other interesting thing that was a surprise to me when you look at these numbers when you look at energy, and I heard Governor Brown talking about this a little bit as well, he got challenged on California being such a large oil producer. And he got into a message of, well, we don't want to be spending cost and wasting fuel to ship it. We don't want to be sending dollars necessarily out of the state. He had a whole list of reasons to, around why California was still producing energy. And while they'll taper it down over time, there was still benefit in doing it. The thing that was most interesting to me is the usage of, of the energy, right? 80 to 90 percent of all economic and environmental impact due to energy is a point of use. And so when you look at a high-speed train and you say that only 4 percent of its cost is energy, the benefit and impact on the environment is, is substantial. So I wanted to give a little bit of a case study of um, of Alstom and something that's a little bit different about our trains and part of the reason why we have adopted this architecture in our trains. If you look at Alstom trains, they have what is called an articulated architecture. The trains, when they're joined, they actually sit on top of a single set of wheels. You know, it's not like a sausage link, it's not like a link of chains. Um, they're, they're rigidly connected and that has lots of benefits from safety to aerodynamics, but it has a huge impact on energy. When you look at energy, it's important to understand and understand why that architecture is important is where is energy used when you move the train? A lot of it has to do with resistance to motion, traction losses, brake losses, some of it's driving behavior, some of it's the passenger, and, and you get a little benefit from regeneration. But, but a lot of it is this resistance to motion concept. And you can see down here, there's a lot of talk about regeneration and the benefit of train regeneration, and there is a benefit. But if you look on the bottom right, it's quite small in the green. The biggest impact on your energy cost is that resistance to motion. Now, part of it is the aerodynamics, and you look at the designs. Uh, all the train manufacturers around the world spend a lot of time focused on aerodynamics. It's why the trains look so nice. It's why they look very different than a lot of other modes of transportation that you see. But the thing that's quite interesting is when you look at the actual um, efficiency and, and taking out that resistance to motion, you can see the axle design of a conventional train versus an articulated train. And in the top image, you see the heat maps of the resistance and the drag that it's causing compared to what you see on an articulated architecture. It's not the best solution for every single application. But in many situations, when you're looking at energy costs, when you're looking at energy reduction, you see a dramatic improvement um, in your fluidity of that vehicle through and your ability to reduce uh, energy consumption. And in some of the studies that have been done in Europe, and when you look at it, um, a traditional non-articulated train will have uh, you know, 16 bogies, 16 platforms where the wheels are sitting. The Euro Duplex, which is the train that SNCF has in a double deck configuration, and some of you may be familiar with, has uh, 13. And when you look at the AGV, which is a train design that's being used in Italy today, we've been able to reduce it down to 12 bogies. We spend a lot of time as an organization trying to figure out how to remove elements of the train that drive energy consumption and allow more profitable operation of the trains. 
won't spend a lot of time on traction losses, but there's also a lot of investment being made in permanent magnet motors and, and moving to much more advanced technologies uh, in, in propulsion to try and take advantage of that as well. And th the new area that's really being looked at closely is driver efficiency. We have found that you can get just 10 to 15 percent improvement in ensuring the drivers are operating the right way. And if you that there's a, what you can call a golden run. You know, imagine you have your uh, commute to work on a daily basis. Some days you get there, you hit all the lights, the timing goes well, and it, you know, you're pretty pleased with how quickly you got to work, or maybe more appropriately, how, how quickly you're able to get home. Uh, a lot of that comes down to having the golden run. And with trains, when you're on a fixed guideway, there is such a thing. And you can, with data and with multiple runs, calculate what that golden run is, and then prompt and train your drivers to be able to achieve that. And through the simple use of technology and through the simple use of prompting, save 10 to 15% of energy, which adds up and, and can become a big deal. The other thing we've seen, to put it in a little bit more context, is when SNCF and the French Railway actually measured the energy usage in kilowatt per train and kilowatt per passenger, they looked at non-articulated trains, conventional trains, and they looked at articulated trains. And you can see the difference in uh, kilowatt consumption per train, 18 versus about 16. And when you look at the kilowatt consumption per, per passenger, 49, sorry, 49 to almost 39. So there's real science there, there's real data there. Uh, again, it's not important for every customer, but where energy consumption is key, where environment is key, it's definitely a solution that a lot of operators look at and a lot of operators have, uh, have come to prefer. And the chart on the left side, that curve, shows you a little bit of non-articulated trains versus the duplex versus the AGV, how that energy consumption uh, is impacted over time. Alstom as a company, uh, we recognize the importance of this. We recognize the responsibility of uh, the rail industry to really take the lead in this space. We have a target now of 20% uh, energy reduction across all of our train platforms. It's something that we're working towards, something that we're striving towards, and um, we're, we're on track to get there and look forward, forward to working with our customers to, to make that happen. So thank you, appreciate your time. Um, Again, if anyone has any questions, be happy to talk with you about it after the fact and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.